Hello and welcome back to the Rubbish Chat Podcast, episode four. We're back for another one, and it's just two of us today, as you'll see. Uh, Mike's off sunning himself somewhere, so is Mike, but delightfully he's decided to come on and we'll get an episode out there for you. So, Mike, welcome. Where are you joining us from today? Uh, in sunny Spain at the moment. Um, I've, you know, unfortunately for me, I've not enjoyed a seven goal thriller like you tonight. Uh, thriller, I think, is pushing it, but we'll get into that game, of course. <laughs> if anyone who's not already subscribed, whatever platform you're watching on, sit subscribe, you'll see all the podcasts out, whether you're watching on YouTube in video form, audio wise, we should, and I'm going to cross my fingers here, be on all the platforms by the time this comes out. So whatever platform you're watching on, go and listen to it over there. Really appreciate you supporting, subscribing, reviewing, liking, commenting, all that stuff that every other podcast tells you. We're asking you to do the same. It takes 10 seconds and we're done. So Mark, we'll get straight into this week's episode as we look at the week in focus. So this week, obviously, the main focus is the two matches back. Football's back, finally. And we started with a win over West Brom on Saturday, 2-1. I give my match reaction over on the channel. So, Mark, over to you. What do you make of Saturday mm. where Rovers deserve winners? I think over the balance of the play, I was, I was quite concerned over the first 20 minutes, if I'm being honest. I thought we struggled to get a kick. Um, and it was, it was almost... Roles reversed from when we used to have Mowbray as manager. It, it felt very similar in terms of West Brom dominated the play and we cut them open quite quickly. Um, very, very clinical, which is is not something you would necessarily say of Rovers. And actually, ironically, I thought we controlled the game from then on um, and, and occasionally looked a bit vulnerable in defence. But, but we were obviously been talking as the season's built up how we felt that we, the problem could be creating. And I felt we looked very, very dangerous every single time we went forward. And I don't just think that was because of West Brom. I know they were obviously conscious of their defensive uh, struggles, shall we say. Um, but I felt it was actually, we just looked very creative when we were going forward. I think as well, the positives for me is that was without a signing in this attacking lineup. Even the signings yeah. have already made. Now, Lenny, it yeah. will go on to discuss in the Warsaw game. Sigurdsson still got mm. two months. If we can then, hopefully, with all the money that's coming this week, uh, if we can add another striker to that, we kind of look like we're in a position that maybe it's not all doom and gloom. Maybe we can go on and make that extra step. Yeah. We're not getting ahead of ourselves. And, of course, we'll discuss expectations soon. But Tuesday yeah. night, then, saw the Carabao Cup tie, the traditional one on a Tuesday yeah. after the first game of the season. Like you mentioned, seven goal. I won't use the word thriller because I won't bring it up too much. <laughs> but seven goal, enjoyable night. As you always run out, four free winners. Uh, with goals from Gilsane and Ennis, Buckley and Garrett. So a good win there again. The match reaction's over on the mm. channel. I thought it was a good game one for the money we paid. Always enjoyable when you actually get goals out of a game. <laughs> Defensively, I thought we were poor at times, but attacking might yeah. be very good. Mark, I just want to focus on Zach Gilsane. Mm. Now we discussed him a lot over pre-season. Got his goal tonight. Yeah. Do you see him having a role now going forward in the first team setup? I, th I think what's probably been levelled at, at him has been how productive he is in terms of assists and goals. So the fact he's come in, first start, first assist, uh, and a first goal, yeah, I think, you, you you know. And in terms of just moving, not moving on fully from him, but looking at them as a whole, the fact that we've got Ennis and Gilsman and we've had the two on Saturday that scored in the first start, and they're all new, you know, including Garrett, there's five new people that haven't scored previously. It's such a positive. Um, but yeah, in terms of answering any question, I think I think he's got to. You know, we've got an arm man bench as well, which gives us a bit more freedom. I think he will find himself on the bench and, and get a chance now. Yeah, it was really positive to see, weren't it? And I'm glad he's mm. followed on from pre-season. Players have had good pre-seasons yeah. before, and then got the chance yeah. in the cup and kind of flopped yeah. really. But I thought he was really good, and he was the key man on the night. I know who scored give the mm. man of the match to Hedges, but for me. Gilson and deserved it by far. Yeah. Obviously, we mentioned these two games. Rovers then made the trip to Rotherham, who lost on the opening day to a quite a resurgent start side. So I find that hard to judge mm -hmm. them. Beat West Brom midweek, uh, which I think's kind of a good judgment as well. How do you feel heading to Rotherham? Because last year we felt very positive heading there, and then we all know what happened in that game. Is it a case of mm -hmm. cautiously optimistic as we go into Saturday? Yeah, I think so. I think it's just a big test for some of these lads as well. You know, we know Rotherham will be organised. We know that there's there's some big, strong lads. and We know that what they will bring. Uh, having said that, I thought that, um, you know, Hyam was immense in the air on Saturday. 
And if it can repeat that, then I'm not too worried um, about their aerial threat. But, yeah, I think cautious optimistic is absolutely the words I would use, yeah. Yeah, I think it's one that we go into thinking we can get some it. It's not a game that scares me going to. Of course, that's no. not right in the mouth. We know what they did to us last week, uh, last year, sorry, but oh, I think it's one Rovers can go and get six points. Speaking of expectations, we'll go on to cover yeah. a really good question we had on Twitter as well and a point you brought up. Uh, you brought yeah. up, sorry. Do the expectations change now going into the season? We've got all this money coming now that yeah. we'll go on to discuss. We've got a win on the board, a win in the cup as well with a lot of young lads. Are the expectations changing now, Mark, into, do you know what, Rovers could actually make a good go of it, which is what we probably felt at the end of June? Yeah, not for me. I think I'm still um, a 20-goal season striker short. Now, that 20-goal season striker could be an Iwanis. Let's be honest, he's been written off a little bit, possibly because he's come on a free, possibly because he's been injured. He's never played in the Championship, and it could be him. Um, but we're still short of that man, and we're still, for me, short of another attacking option, which is, you know, We've obviously been linked with Ben Dope. Um, you know, he's he's un- untested in terms of first team football, but I think we are short of that stardust, that Harvey Elliott that we used to have, that that one man. I think we've got the other makings of a really good solid championship team. It's that that will will cost us in, in games, really. Yeah, I think the proof in the pudding, if we're sat here ten games down the line and Rovers are scoring goals, oh, yeah. well, etc. I think yeah. I think the October break's one that's good for me to judge. If you get to that point, you're in mm. a good run of form. You've shown the yeah. right patterns. I think you then look to, can we still be there by Christmas? And then you look to the dreaded February and March months. But again, <laughs> I think expectations are, you, of course you get excited when you win a game. Of course you get excited when you perform like you did in them two minutes against West Brom. But it's 90 minutes. We'll come up against better yeah. teams with all respect to West Brom. We've got to consider that. So we mentioned the money now. A lot's happened over the week. We'll go over it all. The first oh, one. Yeah. Leopold Volstead signing on Tuesday. We knew it were happening mm. all week. We've kind of been sat on yeah. the video to release it for a week. We finally got it out. What do you <laughs> make of the deal? How do you feel about the competition for NC yeah. Pairs as well now going forward? I'm cautiously, again, optimistic. Um, I think it's it's a good deal. We, what we've not done is signed somebody who's definitely going to replace NC Pairs now and is probably not going to. I think he's got, seems to have the self confidence that he will do, but doesn't necessarily come in going, I should be number one tomorrow. I think that's right. I think Ainsley Pez has deserved his chance. But equally, this this young lad's got some confidence. From what we've seen and what we've heard, um, you know, he's got a lot of potential, is probably the word I would use at the moment. Um, and that is good because there's a similar age to Ainsley Pez. And that's good because obviously Ainsley Pez hasn't proved it over a long period of time. And I still think there's a lot of growth that he needs to do. And I think he's probably got it in him. So that's two goalkeepers now that could be well be on a similar level and could push each other without either thinking, actually, I have the, the right to be number one. If any of them have that, it's probably into pairs at the moment, though. I think it's healthy. Healthy competition's a word, yeah. isn't it? With all respect to Joe Hilton, Jordan Easton, having a young keeper behind you is not a challenge for Enzo pairs. It's not at all. Having no. that keeper coming in, 24-year-old, three-year deal, not even in the prime, probably six years away from his prime, Having that competition, yeah. Swedish international as well, I think it's massive mm. for uh, in suppose as well, and I think, if they can push each other. Yeah, I think for Walstead as well, what isn't being expected here is not being expected to come in and, and right, you are committing yeah. to give replacement. So if he comes and it is a massive good shot, which you never know until he lands, um, then it doesn't really matter as much. He's got time to go and make some mistakes in the 21s internal games. And actually, he will get a chance before the season's out, whether that's in the Cup, whether he ends up as an absolute shocker, whether it's you know a run of form um, that he's just showing in the other games, or whether there's an injury. So he will get his chance, but he doesn't have to come in and perform instantly, which is such a massive bonus for him um, because it means he can grow into our team and grow into the Championship in English football, I suppose. Yeah, I completely agree. I haven't thought about that point mm-hmm. of Kaminsky coming and knew we were number one straight away almost, didn't he? Whereas, like yeah, he did, yeah. Polstead's yeah. not got that behind him. I think that's a key point, actually. Uh, we'll move on to the Waggett interview, which we referenced there, that came out on Friday. A shock it came out, actually. Mm-hmm. I weren't expecting it to. Mm-hmm. I know he's got his critics, and I know people rightly so have issues with him. I think he said himself as well in the past that he recognises why people think this way. 
I was just very mm. happy. I don't know about you, Mark. I was just glad that mm. he come out and said to me, he's put his neck on the line in terms of saying some money will be respent on transfers as well, which gives you that reassurance because in my eyes, he wouldn't have come out and said it unless yeah. it was going to happen. So how do you feel about that interview, Mark? Is it, again, adding a level of reassurance? Yeah, it's all you ever want. I think, I, you know, I've listened to both of them. I listened to one on the, the Rovers put out and the one on Radio Lancashire, which was was really good, uh, really in-depth, actually, a good half an hour. And the Bears really probed him as well. Um, and Steve Waggett, you know, for all his, his photos, all he actually wants to do is the best he can do for in his role, which is to make the club as sound a business as they can be, which I know we're not a business, we're a football club, but there is an element of that, and he, that's his job. Um, so sometimes unashamedly so I think you know that's his argument around tickets and things like that and all you ever want is somebody to come out and be open and honest and actually I don't think people might disagree with certain elements of it and they might want to do it differently if it was them but I don't think actually you could disagree with his reasoning for any of it um, and it was really open and honest and that's all you ever want it's some of the things we don't want to hear we want to hear we're going to go and buy a new Jordan run so we're going to buy the, of course we do but Actually, what he said was open and honest, clear communication. That's all you ever want. I think it, it was the same with Greg, wasn't it? In January, when everything Absolutely. went to use a better yeah. word, everything messed up <laughs> against uh, with Lewis Brown. Yeah. Greg just come out and said, "Do you know what it went wrong?" And I think people appreciate that. People appreciate mm-hmm. honesty and open uh, open stuff. The worst thing's not knowing. I said this mm-hmm. last week's podcast. The issue is we don't know. If we at least knew yeah. we were in trouble, I'd be like, right, we know what it is. But it's just glad that we're yeah. le- relieved and glad that we can actually move on and focus on the football, like I said before. Uh, final bit of mention in the week in focus is the kit survey. We wanted to bring it up because mm. I think it's a good part to have it. A lot of complaints come out about the kit. You never please everyone with a kit. Mm. We'll say that. No, no, no. I don't like the third kit. I know a lot of people do. I love the second one. I've seen people complain about it. All about opinions, but <laughs> if you just wanted to mention, if anyone's not seen it, that the club have released a survey uh, where you can basically choose what you'd like to have on the kits. They'll take consideration of all the options, uh, all the comments, mm-hmm. and they'll try and make a kit that's best for everyone. So I'll leave all that down below. I mm-hmm. think it's just refreshing again, really, that someone can come out and you but, can yeah. say, well, I want this on the kit. I don't want... I'm sure there's a few answers like what colour would you avoid on the kit that will be common that the club will already know. But the main thing is to yeah. get your opinions out. If they're giving you the chance to get your opinions, go and do it because it's not often you get the chance to put your opinion as a fan in the club. So let's make sure. No, we're... and I, I think the other thing is a lot of people have an opinion about the kit and they say, oh, why do the club never consult the fans? So actually, it's also one of them that if we say we want something, Make sure that the response to the survey is heavy. Make sure it, there's a lot of response because then it shows actually there's some there's some mileage in doing this. Let's ask the fans if they get five hundred responses, they're just not going to bother again because no, it's, pointless. it's negligible, isn't it? Yeah, it's pointless wasting time as silly as it sounds. Yeah. If you don't respond to it, the point we had with a fans day against your own, and that I actually just want to mention yeah. thank you to everyone that turned up as well. I don't think we mentioned it last week. Incredible day. So thank you for that. Uh, we'll move on now. We'll move on to a guest section. Really interesting guest this week. So a bit different from the norm. We sit down with a former Rovers Academy player, uh, Dan McNally, who basically spent time in the under-15s, captain the side when James Beattie, uh, David Dunn and the lights were coming through and then was released and ended up going on to be a, a big, big name at FC Cincinnati in the MLS, top of the league at the time of recording. So we'll insert that here. The full episode will be out later on this month. But we'll listen to what Dan has to say, go over his time at Blackburn and his time in America, and then we'll come back in for the mailbag. Dan, welcome to the channel. How are we? Good. Thank you for having me. No, thank you very much for coming on. So, just to explain to everyone, so Dan's the Vice President of Soccer Operations at FC Cincinnati, but he actually started over, he was born over in England, very close to would actually. So, do you just want to tell people about your early life? Yeah, I was, um, so I was born in Darwin, uh, 1978, um, so um, I played all the way through uh, kind of the youth setup. I, w- I was a Blackburn Rovers 
as a young player from um, I was there for four years in the academy from 1989 to 1993. It was actually called the School of Excellence uh, back then, but now it's basically the same as as the academy. And yeah, I was uh, there at the same time as uh, David Dunn. And uh, I kind of grew up with uh, James BT, who's a, who went on to have a great career. Um, I left Blackburn when I was 15, uh, 1993, I, I think. And then um, I ended up signing as an apprentice professional at Berry FC. So I'd done two years there as an apprentice. But then I actually signed a, a scholarship to come to America when I was 18 to play in uh, Daytona Beach, Florida. So I moved from Darwin to Daytona Beach, Florida, which is not a path many other people have ever taken, but that's what I did. So, and I've been in America ever since now. Um, 26 years I've been in America. Yeah, we're going to say it's not a path many people do. It's not much. <laughs> uh, I don't think you get much better in terms of an improvement in places. Darwin's great, but <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine it's Florida. Uh, so you mentioned BT and Dunn there. Was there anyone else around the academy that time that we might know that has gone on maybe elsewhere as well? Well, it's funny, actually, is that when um, when I was at Blackburn as a young player, it was kind of the transition, if you think, between being like a you know a first division kind of championship club and then Jack Walker taking over and the money coming in. Um, so um, for, for everyone in Blackburn, around Blackburn and Blackburn fans, it was brilliant when Jack Walker came in because all the money came into the club and it was amazing. But um, for myself personally, what happened is, is that when when Jack Walker came in and all the money, it seemed like all of a sudden we weren't just recruiting young players from, you know, Darwin, Blackburn, Accrington, Preston. Then all of a sudden players from all over Britain came to the club and Ireland. And I remember being in the locker room once and uh, they brought in a bunch of Irish lads and uh, Damien Duff was one of them. So <laughs> I think I'd done one training session with Damien Duff and a few of the other Irish guys that they brought in and, and uh, the level just went up. It went from being like a maybe like a championship league one championship level type of academy to being like a top premier league academy. And uh, yeah, basically that's when they released me. So, <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, it was an exciting time to be around it because you could just feel that the club was, was going up a couple of levels, you know? Yeah, definitely. It, it seems like that time was just everything improves and we still benefit from it. Now, obviously you see all the young lads coming through it. Uh, you mentioned Dunn as well. How good was he at youth level? Was he as good as he went on to be for Rovers? Was he a key player around the yeah, time? Yeah, he was. He was. He's actually done his a year younger than me, um, but he was training with the the boys of a year above. So he trained with us, and he was special. Do you know what I mean? He just had a great touch, great balance. He was a real competitor. He's a real character. I've actually got to know uh, Dunny quite well over the years. Um, he's been out to visit me in America a couple of times, and I see him when I come home. Um, and uh, he's, he's a great guy, very funny, funny guy, a funny lad, like, as I'm sure he, all the Rovers fans probably appreciate, but he was a, a, a brilliant player. And, you know, of all, of all the players that came through at that time, I mean, Dunny, Damien Duff, James Beattie, those are the those are the guys that went on to have a really brilliant careers, you know? Yeah, we've had the pleasure of having James Beattie on the channel as well. And, you know, he were brilliant talking about his time here. She mentioned the move to America, so what happened once you actually got there, once you were doing your professional, uh, once you were doing your scholarship, sorry, over there, you know, where did that take you in football? Yeah, so I'd done a four years playing in college um, and then I uh, I I played kind of semi-professionally for a couple of years um, for teams in Florida. But then I got into the coaching world and I played uh, and I was a coach for then. Um, an assistant coach in college and I became a head coach in college and I left Florida for uh, Montana. And I ended up in uh, in Montana for a number of years um, as a head coach. And then I came back to the University of Cincinnati to be the assistant coach for a really big university here, University of Cincinnati, which was a big step up. Um, and I was there for a couple of years, but I was very fortunate at the time because at that time, that's when FC Cincinnati started, um, the professional team here. Excuse me. And we started in the lower league, the USL, but then kind of graduated up to Major League Soccer, but I was the the first employee of FC Cincinnati. I was like the, the first person in through the door. We had no other staff. I was kind of reporting to to ownership and, and, and how we were going to build it. So it's been a really exciting journey seeing us go from a club. Literally, I was working out of a coffee shop, just trying to plug in my laptop and think of ideas of how to run a professional club. And now 
you know, we have a four hundred million dollar stadium. We're in Major League Soccer. We have a thirty million dollar training center um, that I helped design here. And um, yeah, the club's gone from strength to strength. And right now, we're at the we're the top team in MLS. We're at top of the league, and uh, we have uh, Messi coming to see us in the U.S. Open Cup on August the twenty third. So it's exciting times. It's only been eight. We've only existed as a club for about eight years. But um, I'd like to think some of my experiences growing up in Darwin and Blackburn have helped shape what we have done here because, you know, where we're from in that part of the world, northwest of England, that's the, you really feel it's the centre of the soccer world when you're away from it. When you're there, you maybe don't realise. But uh, growing up for us, you know, you've got Liverpool, Man United, Everton, Man City, um ourselves the rovers preston a couple of other clubs i won't name because we're on a rovers chat here but uh we're just surrounded by professional football growing up and you take it for granted really but when you're here in america you realize wow look what we had around us yeah and you mentioned messi coming to town how big's he been for the game in america because obviously we spoke off air about Mm -hmm. the big names that have been over even beckham you know we must be talking 15 years ago uh, yeah. Ibrahimovic recently, Gerard, etc. How big has he been for football, especially at the start? Is we've seen it all over social media. Yeah, he's made a fantastic start. Where you know he's played four or five games now, and he scored six or seven goals. Um, but he's he, he seems like he looks from the outside looking in like he's really enjoying his his soccer, his football. <laughs> I should say, I shouldn't say soccer on here. Uh, he's really enjoying his football, and um, he's 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 enjoying being here, and and I think. MLS Major League Soccer has a lot to offer players because of the lifestyle in America. Uh, the infrastructure around the game is really developing here where we're building now soccer-specific stadiums, um, training centers. And um, I think the game is just going from strength to strength here. has been a huge leap forward, I'd say, in the, ne- in the last decade. And now with a player like Messi coming over, more exposure, it's only going to get bigger and stronger. So, uh, yeah, he's, he's done brilliant so far. And what are the hopes for Cincinnati for the season? Is it stick around the top? I know the league system's a bit different yeah. as it gets to the end, but is it stick around the top and maybe compete to be champions by the end of it? Yeah, I, th- I think so. I mean, it's, uh, you know, anything can happen in a game of football, as we all know, but we're doing well right now and we've just got to stick with it. It's just old cliches, one game at a time, but we've got a really good squad and hopefully um, by the end of the season, we can be be around the top of the league and, um you know, we're in the semi-finals of the cup as well. So uh, it's, ex- it's ex- exciting times right now. Yeah, and final question, well, one of the final questions is how much do you keep track of Rovers still? He's still watching the games when you can. I appreciate the time difference can... Yeah, no, we're, we're fortunate right now on um, on ESPN Plus, we get a lot of the championship games live. So I watched uh, the Rovers versus West Brom last weekend. It was brilliant. Um, you know, with my two sons, I'm, I'm telling them, oh, this is where I'm from, do you know what I mean? And... Uh, yeah, I always keep keep up to date with how the team's doing. Whenever whenever I'm home, I always try and get to Ewood uh, to watch a game. But, you know, my memories of uh, being a Blackburn fan are all really when I was in my early teens, when the, the brilliant days when we were, you know, going up from the championship in the playoffs. I was, I'll tell you a story, I was down at, uh, I remember watching uh, the Rovers in Plymouth on the way to, you know, I went all the way, the, the away days were brilliant. Um, and I was there for the playoffs against Derby County and then obviously the final against Leicester when we got promoted and then the first few years in the Premier League were unbelievable like it was it's almost at the time you didn't you probably took it for granted but what a team we had with Shearer and Sutton and Ripley and Sherwood in midfield Colin Hendry at the back and uh, Tim Flowers in goal it was like they were good days very good days yeah massively how do you feel for the season going ahead for Rovers as well do you think it could be a year, you know, a special year? Could we push on yeah. from last year? I mean, it was, um, I think, well, first off, from the outside looking in, we've got a fantastic coaching staff. I think the coaching staff looks really, really strong. Um, it looks like there's a good feeling around the club in terms of the crowds. The crowd was looked good against West Brom. We had good attendance. Um, and, and the thing that speaks, again, from the outside looking in, it looks like the academy is producing fantastic players. Um, some of the young, some of the young lads playing for the team now are, are absolutely outstanding, which is probably the future of the club, with the way the with the way the world's going in terms of finances in football. Like producing our own players is is so important. But I I feel positive. I mean, I thought we were very unfortunate last season not to make the playoffs, and um, 
you know, who who knows this year, maybe that experience can help us. We've got a great young team and I, I would love to see the Rovers get in that top six and, 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 and anything can happen once you're in the playoffs. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and for me, I think the, the big thing for Blackburn is is if we were to get promoted, the infrastructure of the club, you're looking at the training centre, Brock Hall and, and Ewood, and we, we've been there and done it. We're Premier League champions, so it won't be a big thing for us in a sense that we we belong in the Premier League. So hopefully this young team can get us back to where we belong. Yeah, fingers crossed. Hopefully a good season for Rovers and FC Cincinnati. Dan, thank you very much for coming on. Uh, all the best for the season ahead as well. Hopefully, like I say, we have two successes with Rovers and Cincinnati. And hopefully, yeah. through in the cup against Messi, that would be a story, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. Thank you very much for having me. No, thank you for coming on as well. I'll link Dan's Twitter down below. Drop him a follow as well. And that's where we round off. So welcome back to the mailbag. Obviously, we take your questions each week and submit, submit them on Twitter, sorry, at Rovistat underscore or on the YouTube post that goes out every Monday. Just three questions today that we picked out. Apologies if we haven't covered your question. Resubmit it next week. Honestly, the amount of question responses we've got, we could be sat here for another hour. Mark's got to get back to the sun or get some sleep for the sun tomorrow. So uh, apologies if we can't get them, but we will answer them, so keep submitting them. The first one comes from 4,000 holes now. The academy's been a big part, and Scott from 4,000 Old has, how much has the lack of transfers helped the academy graduates in the last year? Would they all have appeared anyway? My mm. eyes, no, not at all. I think you young centre-backs, uh, like Ash Phillips, I don't think if we could have got another centre-back in, might have suffered from the game time. Certain ones would have, I think you had a more and would have. But no, I think Harry Leonard's your prime example, isn't it, recently, that if we'd have had a striker yeah. this summer... How often does he play? What do you think of that, Matt? Do you think Rovers would have pushed as many through? Or do you think we're, we've had a hand for Stephen No, It is actually a good thing for the club. Yeah, I think they've had their hand for a little bit more this year. Um, I think Hayden Carter is probably the one that benefited last year a little bit. That's a um, how, however, what I would say is it, the question's a little bit back to front. Is It's almost have they done the right thing because the club made a conscious decision last year. They said that Jake Garrett, for example, needed five to ten games in the first team. So that meant they couldn't afford to bring in another player who would be ahead of him. So actually, it's not so much that the lack of transfers, it's a deliberate lack of transfers. I think this summer has been slightly different. Um, and I think Harry Leonard, for example, wouldn't have got the chance in the first team. He might have well been around the squad, but they will probably gone on loan or one or the other. Um, but I think he's direct impact. You know, he wouldn't have started on Saturday. And probably Dylan Mark Handy. I know he's not come through the academy, but he, he wouldn't. Um, but I think last season, probably Hayden Carter, I think we would have added another centre half depth. And he, unfortunately, which, you know, I think we all, um, right in hindsight, but I think we all probably think he had the quality to be around that first team, probably would have moved on, unfortunately. Unfortunately, uh, because he's somebody who was demanded, really. I want to play first team football. I've done it once, I've got a taste of it. Um, so, yes and no, you know, to get around the houses, but um, I think it's a deliberate thing from the club last year. No, I agree. I think the comment Greg brought and made when it went Tyler Morton come in that these two Adam Morton yes. Jake, yeah, yeah, yeah. at that time, weren't it? It was exactly that. Hey, you mentioned Harry Leonard, question here from Matthew Shaw, perfectly way on to mm. it. How many goals will be a realistic, a realistic target for Leonard this season? Now we're selling mm. his first one. For me, this question's got two different answers to it, and it's on the basis of do Rovers sign a striker? If we go and yeah. sign a striker, I think, I honestly think five or six, because I, f- I don't like mm. judging a striker when he's only getting 20 minutes every week. I find it much harder to judge. If he doesn't, mm. I could see him getting double figures if he keeps creating the chances. It's whether Sam Gallagher gets ahead of him, and that's the question to answer. Mm. Mike, what do you think's a realistic target if we don't get a striker in? Again, I'm, I'm similar to you. I think it, I don't like putting a, t- a number on them. Really, I think if he plays thirty games, and the rate is going, obviously the rate is going, he get thirty goals. But um, he'd be looking around ten, I think. However, for me, that's not the key thing. I know he judged strikers on goals ultimately, but this year for Harry Lennon, it's about how many games can he play and how many games can he affect? Um, and actually, how can he respond? Because throughout his youth career, he scored and scored and scored. How can he respond when he missed two on Saturday and if he hadn't have scored? How can he respond when he does that for five games running? Can he keep wanting to be brave enough to get in those positions? 
that's the bigger test for Harry Weather this season for me. But that said, um, you know, I, I think you'd be hoping between five and ten goals for him. Yeah, and I think it really gives a positive season for him if he goes and does that. I don't yeah. want him to be judged fully on goals. I want him to be judged on no. that movement, that pressing. Mm. I love his mentality. That's the biggest thing for me. When you saw the video of him coming off on Saturday after the game, and he's like that <laughs> to John Dahl going, I should have scored mm. three, I should have scored. You've just yeah. scored your first goal, go and celebrate it. But yeah. you want to I mean, he's not wrong, but yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, he should have had them, but <laughs> he's a much better striker than I am. He doesn't need telling how many goals he should have oh, scored. No, uh, the final question from Welsh Rovers was, which former Rovers player do you think could fit into this JD team best? Ooh. Now, I think it was a very good question. This The first one that come to mind for me straight away was Joe Rothwell. I think he'd suit picking okay. up the ball and driving forward with it. If we're yeah. going just off current ability, I think Joe Rothwell's up there. If we're going off, yeah. say, how good they were since we got relegated, God, I'd love a Jordan Rhodes in this side to just swoop that ball home all the time. He'd have had a hat-trick the other mm. day, I think, in Harry mm. Leonard's position. But who would you go for, Mark? If we're going, we'll go off mm. now. We'll go off how that player is now. Who do you think okay. is the best into JDT's team? Um, I can see, do you know, I haven't thought of Joe Rothwell. I can see Joe Rothwell. There was games last season where nothing was really happening. That middle um, Joe bit. Joe Rothwell used to drive beyond those lines. And, um, do you know, if, if we're including Warns, but we'll part of them, that Stardust for me, uh, Harvey Elliott, uh, Harrison Reed actually, will make a big difference. Um, I, I think... It's hard to ignore David Raya, but I think the one, because of obviously the area that we are all saying we're missing, is Adam Armstrong, because he'd go and get you 30 yards. And, and I just think, whilst you said Jordan Rhodes, and I love Jordan Rhodes, and for me, Jordan Rhodes was a better finisher. He was a better forward in many ways. Actually, under Young Dahl, you need somebody who's quick and can press. And Armstrong yeah. pressing. That in the end wow. as well. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's the, 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 the keepers. We had really drivers up the pitch, and they dad gold, which is you know I think it could that will be a difference maker. Um, so if anyone's got a spare ten million, you know, just let's. We're going to say if someone wants to beat it, to it. That's where we round off the mailbag. <laughs> Thank you to everyone for uh, submitting your questions. Like I said, Rovers Chat underscore on Twitter, or you can go onto YouTube and comment on the post, or leave them below this. But we'll get into the final bit, which is a bit of a different quiz kind of questions this week. So we're just two of us today. We thought we'd do a bit of a different quiz and leave the viewers free questions to answer so you can submit these on Twitter at Robustat underscore or down in the comments. So the first question, and they're all related to our recent signing of Leopold Volstead. Can you name the only other Rovers player to play with the initials LW? They have to have made a first team appearance. It should be pretty. I think most people should get that one. The second one should be, can you name the eight players that have played for Rovers that were born in Sweden. So eight players, Volstead will become the ninth, but can you name the other eight? And the third question is, can you name the three players to play for Rovers with Leo in their name? So as long as the letters L-E-O are featured in the name, whether it's in the middle uh, of a name, at the start of a name, the end, whatever it is, just let us know down below. There's three to get there. We're expecting people to get two out of these. Anyone who gets three out of three can give themselves a pat on the back. But I'll leave all them down below in the description as well and in the comments so you can go and copy and paste and put them wherever you want and give us your answers. But that's where we'll round off for today's episode. Just a bit of a shorter one there with Mike being away and sunning himself. I believe he's submitted his holiday form this week, but he should be back next week whilst we won't have Mark. So, Mark, thank you very much for joining us. Really appreciate you joining, especially when you're away. Commitment to the cause. No problem, no problem. I'm off to cross Julio Santa Cruz off my list because it's not spelled L-E-O, but, you know, technicalities and all that. We'll let you off, Mike. Since you joined us from over there, we'll let you join. But thank you to everyone for watching as well. Really appreciate all the support we've been having on the podcast, on everything else. Uh, remember to subscribe as well. You'll always see an episode from us if you hit subscribe. Leave a like, comment, do all that stuff. Share the podcast as well. If anyone you know is a Rovers fan that doesn't watch it, get them listening. Every week, Thursday, 12pm, and then we'll build up to all the other games all over on the YouTube channel. But until next time, thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon.